Excalibur is having the time of his life right now playing with mommy and we're gonna dive right on into these Q&A questions. So here we go. Almost six whole months of content right here. So here we go. Someone asked me if I am optimistic about the future of women's wrestling. Um, so this was asked a few, like a month ago or less, and um, this person is a frequent interactor with the Taylor Army, so kudos to this person, they are awesome. All right, so am I optimistic about the future of women's wrestling? Yes and no. And that is not a pessimistic answer, I might add, because I think that the, there are some valid points here. Um, am I optimistic about the future of women's wrestling? Yes and no. Yes, because there are so many insanely talented women in the industry, and there are far more opportunities for success now than there were 15 and 20 years ago. So that's progress, that's amazing. And I got you know Excalibur for on my face here. <laughs> Taylor's having us on this today. Um, where I am not very optimistic is uh, people getting opportunities so fast because they're not working as long or, or as hard and maybe that's not always a bad thing but where it starts to become bad and I believe I've touched on this in prior episodes of this podcast on my and on my YouTube channel is I'm seeing this happen more and more. Now that there is a plethora of opportunity and an equal amount of amazingly talented women in the industry, I'm starting to see newer stars kind of fizzle out and burn out fast. And and I think that's because they got so much so soon and they didn't know how to manage it and handle it. And so then they don't understand when it stops what's happening. And I think that is a very toxic and negative situation that's really hard to navigate. I have talked to several women uh, recently who have been trying to navigate that exact thing. Um, and that is very hard because they don't teach you how to navigate that. They don't teach you how to work around that. They don't teach you how to reinvent yourself even if you're not exactly old in the business. They don't teach you a lot of these business skills that you need once you start to realize that you're fizzling out before your time. So then you start to see these girls who say, for example, they got on AEW Dark, they got an opportunity at ROH. Uh, they uh, got to go work in Mexico for a little bit. They also got to go, for example, to do something with stardom or New Japan, right? And then all of a sudden they're coming back to America and they're not really getting many opportunities. Um, and then they start to wonder why, and then they start to get really down on themselves, and then they start diluting themselves to try to fit in, uh, when in reality, in the beginning, they got those opportunities because they stood out. So it, it's a lot. It's a lot, and you're not taught how to deal with that. I think men deal with this too, but I'm going to speak on this from a women's standpoint because this, the question was specifically optimistic about women's, uh, the future of women's wrestling and not just wrestling as a whole. Um, so I think that that's why I would say yes and no about my optimism level for the future of women's wrestling. Um, I think a lot of girls that did work as hard as I did for as long as I did, they're now in positions of power and I don't know if they want to let those go. Um, but there are some out there that really truly do want to help elevate the next few generations that are already in wrestling. Um, and I hope and pray that they help these, these newer women navigate the pitfalls so that they don't have to make the same mistakes or be inducted into this kind of cult-like mentality of different things that are, for whatever reason, socially acceptable in wrestling. But if you break them down to somebody who's not involved in wrestling in the real world, they're like, what? Like, what are you doing? You know, and I think there's a lot of that. Um, and I know that happened to me. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that happens happened to me and to other people. Um, and this isn't just women either, it happens to men as well. So I think that that's why it's a double-edged sword. Um, I think that we can always do better and we should always strive for better and execute on that. And I think if we continue to execute on making more maps to positions of success, uh, for how they look for different individuals and the better off it will be. I hope that makes sense um, because I really do actually truly, firmly, wholeheartedly believe that. Another person asked me, um, how would I write a feud with Trish? This comes after I answered a question about how I would write a feud with Lita. So this is a really, really fun question. I would take a completely different spin with Trish, um, you know, because Trish comes back a lot, which is really, really cool for fans as well as for her because it, it not only keeps her legacy alive in the WWE universe, but it also 
keeps reintroducing her to newer generations of fans, which is so amazing to me. That's like super, I don't know, it's just so cool. Um, especially because it's like seeing your childhood again on TV and they're still thriving and amazing and awesome and totally goals. So what I would do is write a storyline where Trish keeps coming back and I find a way to use that against her because I feel jaded about the fact that she didn't want to work with me. Um, and so I turn that around in such a boss way. Like I literally work my way up the ranks with the sole purpose of becoming her boss. So then I become the reason that she stays relevant. I become the reason that she gets to put food on the table for her family. I'm the reason why the uh, WWE Universe as a whole is still, you know, talking uh, about her name. And if she refuses to do anything that I tell her, then she automatically loses her job. So I think that's a really cool spin because I get to be just this jaded, once babyface turns diabolical heel and it takes a heel Trish and kind of makes this slow transition into a baby face and she's once again in the underdog position as opposed to a position of power that she is in and I think that's a really cool power struggle struggle and dynamic uh you know like I'm the reason that you get to eat I'm the reason that you're still relevant you didn't want to work with me as an up-and-comer well now all you're ever going to do is work because of me like one of those sorts of things I think that that could be such a cool storyline that could actually take a really long time and you wouldn't get bored of it if it's written in the proper way like you could literally get about more than six months of content you could literally go from one wrestlemania to the next with just this storyline and i think that's really cool because it's consistent pay it's consistent entertainment and it's a consistent storyline that i feel the fans could really get in on because who's Tell me a person who, I literally have my cat's fur stuck in my eyelashes. Tell me a person who has not wanted to turn the power dynamic around. You know, in, in you know, oh, you guys didn't want to offer me a seat at the table, so then I came with my own damn table. That's the kind of vibe, you know what I mean? Like, oh, you guys wanted to discredit me? Well, guess what, I'm your boss now. I'm the reason why you get to eat. You know, that's such a boss move. Um, I think that would be a really great storyline and it offers a certain amount of depth for something that she hasn't done in such a long time. And I think that would be really cool to get even more of her creative juices really going. I think that would be such a fun storyline. Um, and it's really, really cool. Uh, I would be so happy to write that storyline for Trish. Like, I think that would be such such a really cool way to show a woman go from a heel to an underdog babyface, even though she's a WWE legend. Um, you know, she had such a huge pivotal role in changing the trajectory of women's wrestling. Um, you know, there were so many women that came before her, but she had such a pivotal role on continuing the ideals that they left behind, hoping someone would pick up. And here comes Trish and she picked it up and she ran with it to the best of her abilities. I think that's absolutely amazing. We owe so much. Um, so I think that's a really cool spin on her legacy is to do something like that. And then she gets the huge payoff in the end and I get my comeuppance, but it's such a long story to get there. And first she gets completely screwed over, which makes you want to see her come out on top even more. I, there, I would love to write that. Okay, next question. Do I embrace deep AI fakes and its potential implications for the wrestling industry? No, no, I do not. We've already um, had to deal with deep fakes um, for quite a while now, and especially as it relates to women. Um, and so I think embracing deep fake AI material for wrestling is actually going to be detrimental to a lot of the wrestlers in this business because they're going to become obsolete, just like a lot of jobs are already way ahead of schedule becoming obsolete. I mean, there's there's beauty salons now that are using AI machine technology. Uh, you have self-checkouts. You've got, you know, robots at the grocery stores doing grocery shopping for people. Um, I think there was a McDonald's in Texas that we reported about on this podcast that is completely AI, no human contact whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? So I think this is very scary for our future because universal income is going to drag some people, a lot of people down and boost some people up and nobody's going to understand how to handle that. Um, 
and it's going to eliminate a lot of jobs that are high paying for people that didn't go to college and I just don't think that's fair. Uh, like one of the jobs that they're pushing to eliminate is truck drivers and in case you guys didn't know, uh, for men in particular, that's one of the highest paying jobs for men that did not go to college. Um, I mean, as it should because it's a dangerous job. But yeah, that they're trying to take over all kinds of stuff like that with AI. And I think that there's a lot of implications for the wrestling business and for acting and for all kinds of other things that don't end up very well for the humans um, that had dreams of grandeur for things like professional wrestling. Um, another person asked me, uh, what are some tips uh, for saving up to buy a car? Very simple. Uh, if you don't, if you can't afford it twice, don't buy it at all. Um, try to eliminate as much credit card debt as possible. Um, figure out how to lease a car. Leasing a car, um, in my opinion, is better than outright buying a car at a certain point because there's a lot more things that are covered under a lease agreement as opposed to owning a car outright. Um, and if you're already strapped for money, I think it's better to have it be someone else's responsibility um, under a warranty as opposed to all out of your pocket to fix, especially with so many people's cars getting broken into and so many different cars having soy coatings on the, um, the, the wirings, which are apparently particularly tasty to rats. And that's usually not covered under your insurances. Um, and there's just, there's just so much stuff going on. So if you can't afford to buy something twice, don't buy it at all. Start learning how to cook at home. Um, make meals that can make dinners that can turn into lunches for the next several days. That's how you save money. Um, and you know, not everybody needs to eat five meals a day. I see so many different eating trends where they want you to be eating five and six meals a day. Honestly, I don't do that. And I feel my healthiest when I don't do that. I find that I am hungrier so much more, the more that I eat. Um, and I just don't like that feeling of like constantly counting down on my watch until the next time I get to have my pre-planned meal. I just can't stand that. Um, and it ends up costing more money because you go through more food. So plan out your meals and don't forget the healthier you are, the more cost efficient you are. People want you to be sick and want you to have health problems. So then you're constantly paying for meds and doctors and all kinds of stuff. Now I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a doctor. So this is not medical advice. I'm just telling you what works for me. When I first moved on my own, I was already, you know, in wrestling for many years at that point. And one of the ways I saved money was learning to shut off my lights and stuff when they weren't being used and make meals that last. So if I make a dinner, I plan on having that for two, at least two lunches. You know, leftovers are king, okay? Don't be, don't be ashamed of leftovers. Um, also, start being more wise with your money. Um, like, a lot of times we buy the latest Amazon gadgets and all kinds of things. Like, you don't need it. Would it be great to have it? Of course, but do you need it? What's more, what do you need more? A car or the latest Amazon gadget? Yeah, like, do you need a drone? Do you, do you need the, the latest Jordans or Nikes or Gucci bag? Probably not. So those are some of the ways in which I would save up for a car. And I would also, I, I, I would start budgeting as well. Like figure out what your habits are, the good ones and the bad ones. Cause don't forget, we always talk about first you make your habits and then your habits make you. So if you have some bad habits that lead to you spending extra money that you don't have, figure out a way to change that habit or habits. And then you'll end up with more money. Um, and try to, you know, if you have credit cards and stuff, try to pay down those balances as soon as you can, uh, because then your credit will go up and then you're in a much better position, uh, for buying a car or leasing a car, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, okay. Another person asked me, uh, would I ever wrestle Melina? Absolutely. Um, I think Melina is a really, really cool chick. I think she's very underrated. Um, and so, yeah, I would totally welcome the opportunity to wrestle with her. I think that would be absolute wrestling magic. <laughs> Um, another person asked me, have I ever had a bad hair day? Almost every day of my life. I mean, look at this. I am not great when it comes to hair. And that was even before my, my, uh, my hand surgery. Now I am virtually non-existent. Like for this, I literally just took my hair out of a top knot, brushed it and threw on a hat because I just, I'm not great at hair. I'm just, I never have been. I was never great at makeup or hair. I didn't have fashion sense when I got into wrestling. I think wrestling would have been a lot more successful early on and a lot less painful if I would have had like fashion skills and, and that kind of self-awareness, you know, I, so many stories. <laughs> um, 
would I ever live in another country besides the United States? If so, which one and why? I don't know. I've always had like a gypsy soul. So there's a lot of places I would love to live. That's one of the things that drew me to the whole tiny house movement um, that I talked about incessantly at our age. Um, I would totally love to live in Scotland, England, Italy, maybe even Germany because I really just the fresh air at the, the apples were some of the best apples I think the honestly the best apples I've ever had in my life um I actually really really loved Switzerland I spent several days in Switzerland and the shop besides the fact that they didn't use dressing rooms in the places that I went shopping in like other than that like I enjoyed the food um I enjoyed the shopping I enjoyed the atmosphere it was absolutely gorgeous um let me see yeah yeah I guess did I say Italy <laughs> so many shots to my head all right we'll move on um do I follow any gossip topics um I follow very closely and I'm not ashamed to say it um the whole royal family stuff like I I really love um Princess Catherine of Wales um I think that she is just so genuine she's full of gumption she's down to earth she's hardworking. she is full of class um, she's very intelligent she's so well put together um, and I just love her her innate compassion and empathy and, and her her skills as a woman as a wife as a mother as a daughter and as a princess of a country like I, I just think from top to bottom she's absolutely phenomenal she's so amazing so um i find a lot of inspiration within her so i follow the royal family stuff pretty closely with like Meghan markle prince harry prince uh, william and princess catherine um and i make no apologies for that let me see here um someone asked me what is a rematch i would like to have okay probably santana garrett i would work with her until i retire i absolutely adore her um, in and outside of the ring. Like I, I actually really enjoy working with her. Um, another rematch I would like to have, I would totally do another rematch with Mandy Leon, uh, with Kelly Klein, with who else would I enjoy wrestling again? You know, I never got to have a singles with Holiday. Um, I only got to work in tag team matches against her, so that would be kind of interesting. Um, let me see here. A singles match. You know, another singles match I would welcome is actually Mercedes Money, which brings me to, I will skip ahead to one of these other questions. Someone asked me if I would wrestle Mercedes Money in New Japan. Um, I wrestled her when we were both very, very young in our careers. Like I, I had the name Taylor Hendricks, I think already, but yeah, I wasn't really Taylor Hendricks yet. And she was still Mercedes KB. Like she hadn't grown into Sasha Banks yet. So we were both just babies in the business. Um, and so I think that would be really cool to have a rematch with how far we both have come as individuals, as superstars, as women, as performers, and you know, people that went after their childhood dreams. Like to me, that's very power powerful. So I would totally do that. Um... What was my favorite tag team that I was in? I would probably say myself and Chelsea Green. Um, I really wish that would have been booked better and more because we could have had, there was such a hiatus from the time that we won the belts for, for, and to the times that we got to defend the belts. And one of our fun matches where I actually had a fractured ankle was against Santana Garrett and Raquel. And that wasn't even like with our belts on the line. So I really wish that we could have done more with that because I had a lot of fun working with her. Um, so yes. Uh, who are some men I would sign? Okay, I think this is a piggyback question because someone had asked me recently in a Q&A, who are some women that I would sign if I had, like, say, a, um, a, a televised company? I, first of all, would keep things small. Um, I think you bleed money as a business when you have your rosters too big too fast and you don't really get to develop stars to their fullest potential, which is poor for everybody all around. It's just bad, bad business. It's bad for you as a superstar. Um, and it's bad for the company because you know, you're bleeding money to pay this person a salary, um, but you're not utilizing them to their fullest potential. So why did you bother signing them to begin with? You know, it's a, it's a double edged sword there. Um, I would probably sign Dom Cyrus, RJ Santos, uh, possibly Julius Coleman. 
Um, let me see here. Uh, Callisto, who is Samurai Del Sol. Ricky Mandel, uh, Super Mix Hernandez. Um, Midas Creed, Leo Rush. Um, and I would probably want to take one or two more people from Mexico um, as well, just to get like a really awesome mix. I would also probably throw the Anomaly Alex Ace in there because he is so different. I mean, it's in the name, the Anomaly Alex Ace. Um, and that would put like a really cool, well-rounded roster. You have uh, young high flyers, you've got muscle guys, you've got, you know, almost seven foot tall guys, you've got really charismatic guys, you've got guys that can go, you've got young up and coming talent, you've got lucha talent. So to me, that's just such a great mix. Um, I would also consider Drago. Um, I know he just recently changed his name, but I actually don't know what it's changed to yet. So um, I think that would be very interesting. And that's how I would want to keep it. I would want a very diverse, really cool roster, roster to be really well balanced in the sense that you appeal to multiple different demographics, but you can have opportunities for good chemistry and also really great learning opportunities for young up and coming talent to learn things the right way with respect and dedication, as well as veterans that really deserve a great home. Um, where they can not only continue their legacy, but also pass on their legacy to deserving talent and create just an amazing show. And these guys that I named can all go. Um, so I would totally put my name behind those people and say like, hey, these are people worth looking at. Um, and I stand by that. Um, another person asked me, would I ever be a coach at NXT? I think I would make an excellent coach at NXT. Uh, you know, because I am a woman who has done the been in this business since I was a minor. Um, I have gone all kinds of places. I've been exposed to all kinds of different situations, both on camera and off. Um, I'm very creative as a published author. I also think that I have a really good mind for television and camera angles and little details that take someone from indie darling to wrestling superstar. Um, and I think those are assets that I possess that I am able to give to other people. Uh, whether it's writing promos, whether it's developing little nuances for the characters, whether it's helping them come up with a unique look where it doesn't look like you're trying too hard, uh, but you're also standing out because you're not doing all the same things as everybody else on the indies. Like, like girls gear right now, they all look so, like, too similar. And that grinds my gears so much. Like, you guys don't have the same gimmicks, so why do you guys have so, so many of the same characteristics in your gear? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. It just grinds my gears um so yeah i think with with promos with ring awareness camera angles putting a whole polished you know presentation together for you the fans like i would be so great at that um honestly i i genuinely i genuinely feel like i would um someone asked me for more safety tips they said they really like that segment and they want me to do more well thank you um i guess safety tips i have two in particular um, these safety tips are, you know, whether they apply to you or not, they are good to know and keep in mind, especially because you probably know someone where it is applicable. Um, so one of the safety tips I would say is never with your dogs, with your children or with yourself, never stand right at the curb. You have no idea if there is going to be a car that is not paying attention or loses control and hops the curb. Keep your pets, keep you, keep your children away from the curb. You would be surprised how much that actually happens. And it does not end well. The other safety tip I have is being aware of your surroundings. We talk about this a lot, whether it's in the ring, being a wrestler on the road, or just living your day-to-day -day life, honestly. A lot of people, mostly women, get attacked um, next to their car, or next to their front door. And the reason being is they're not paying attention. And your hands are usually full with bags or with a child or with a pet. And this is a perfect opportunity for someone who's scoping you out as a target. I've actually seen quite a few videos of this on social media, so I think it's a perfect time to talk about it. If you are carrying your child and trying to get into your car or into your front door, you're probably not paying attention to your surroundings and your hands are full. You are not able to defend yourself. This is how children get stolen. This is how you get mugged or worse. Um, you know, whether it's a home invasion, car robbery, or, you know, kidnapping, etc. Neither of those things are particularly pleasant, to put that mildly. So my suggestion is to always put yourself at a degree angle, okay? 
if your house has a long wall where your door is and you're trying to get in your door and you have like a toddler or a pet or grocery bags and you're trying to open with the key put your back up against the wall of the house so that you can see your surroundings while you are opening because once you start to go in your house and your back is fully turned that's when you're going to get hit by the target um well as the target i should say by your perk um so yeah those are two things that i think people should be so much more aware and they sound so simple but when you're just in the moment living your day-to-day -day life and not paying attention to your surroundings these things were all guilty of it and so that's why we have to acknowledge the fact that we live in a completely different world now one that we probably could not have imagined back in 2010 or the year 2000 okay like 2023 is its own beast and we have to be more aware and stop wishing that the world was different and realize that we're living in the world that we're in now. So you can wish it to be different all you want, but it's not going to change itself. So you have to change how you operate in it. And so if I had a toddler or if I was with my dogs, for example, I would position my body at an angle to where I can see what's going on in my peripheral vision so someone doesn't sneak up on me, for example. And um, I also, when I am, for example, taking my groceries out of the car or whatever I bought, I always take my pocketbook with me. I am not surprised. There are so many people that leave their pocketbook right there and turn their back to put stuff in the trunk or whatever. That's a perfect way to get snatched. It really, really is. So put your pocketbook with you. Put it in the trunk while you're putting the stuff in the trunk. Never just leave it in the cart and be more aware of your surroundings. Never stand right on the curb. Stand as far away from the curb as you possibly can. Um, so those are some safety tips that I would most especially <laughs> uh, be mindful of. Um, another person asked me, what is something that they don't teach you in school but should? Um, they also love this segment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do too. Um, something that they don't teach you in school but I feel they should. I was learning about this last year and I've been following up on it this year. They should really teach you the difference about a will versus a living trust or a trust in general. A will, the government can still be in charge of that, which means it takes a long time and they can try to take stuff from it and so forth. But if you have a living trust or an actual trust, the government can't really get their hands on it and that's why they don't like those as much. Um, if you have a living trust, you're setting that up while you're alive and there's all these stipulations. Um, that you put into place and then a trust in general is where you can put all your assets so then the government can't take them or touch them such as you know buying real estate or different investments and money and so forth it just makes it a lot more protected like if you have an LLC put that under your trust and so forth I'm not a financial advisor I'm not responsible for what you do with your money but I do think we should learn more about that especially since we just recently in a different segment uh, for what they don't teach you in school but should and we talked about all the different taxes that get taxed on the wealthy and middle class and so forth and the rich um, I think this is another one that they should teach you but they don't because they don't want you to know just like they don't want you to know about the wealth tax that they um, impose upon anyone that has a million dollars or more that we talked about, I think, last week. Um, yeah, so I definitely think that you should do, pay attention to that. Um, another person asked me, what's my favorite part of working with Russo's brand? Honestly, I absolutely adore, and I'm not just saying that because my podcast airs on their program. Like, I genuinely enjoy what I do for Russo's brand. I get treated with immense respect I get treated with camaraderie and support. Uh, like I feel like Russo's brand has been so supportive in so much of what I do, whether it's my YouTube channel, this podcast, my books, like whenever I have, and I interacted with Vince Russo on multiple occasions, even before working with him, like I would send him tapes of mine or promos to get like opinions and stuff. Um, this is stuff that I did with Terry Taylor, with Les Thatcher, uh, with, um, um, Adam Pierce and so much more. Um, I, I've gotten a lot of feedback that I ultimately applied to, you know, my, my work. And to me, that's an invaluable asset. Like the intrinsic value of that is just immeasurable. Um, so I have never had a bad instance working with Vince Russo ever, ever for many, many years now, even before Russo's brand. And I think one of my absolute favorite parts of working with Russo's brand is just the opportunity it's provided me, uh, uh for getting to be myself. Like I get to genuinely be myself with my fans and get paid to do it and also get to build lasting connections that I may not have had otherwise. And to me, that's, that's amazing. You know, instead of just giving everybody the 
narrative that other people have tried so hard to get everyone to believe of me. I have just been able to be myself on here for all of you to see consistently and not have to worry about other people's narrative of me because I am busy in my lane doing, you know, what I do. And to me, that's been one of the most freeing, powerful gifts, which I talk about a lot, which is getting to be free with my authenticity. And that to me is one of the best gifts that I have gotten. Uh, I have received from working with Russo's brand. We are going to take our second break of the episode. When we come back, we've got more questions for you.